week ago, we gathered to talk about the mystery of the church. Hello, Hello. And uh, what, what did I quote? I'm going to test your memory now for a week ago. So what did they say in the Netherlands? God, yes. Anybody here last week? God, yes. Jesus, yes. Church? No. No, right. So by the end of last week, I hope you realize that from a Catholic point of view, you can't have belief in God and Jesus without the church. So God, yes. Jesus, yes. The church, yes. Right? So it is the living body of Christ on earth. So that's the, uh, you know, if we had no church, we would have no gospels. We would have no belief in Christ. We would not have the gospel being handed down for 2,000 years. So um, the church was the living, breathing followers of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, who eventually wrote the four Gospels. Uh, one of them, Paul, we're going to be looking at him in another evening this semester, wrote letters that are still being read that we hear on Sundays at Mass. So um, the living Christian community handed on the good news of Jesus. So, so tonight we're going to move into the next topic, which is an introduction to sacraments. So I think it's important to realize, and for those of you who've been with us since last September, or if you caught up on videos, we did an introduction to Catholicism, and one of the things that I highlighted at the very beginning is we Catholics wear what we call sacramental glasses. So we look at the whole universe, in a, in a sense, with a sacramental vision. What does that mean? We see the, the sacred presence of God at work in all creation. Uh, I said early on, we see the fingerprints of God on creation. So uh, the world that we live in, the entire universe, this beautiful planet Earth, our solar system, our galaxy, the world in its immensity, we believe it's all created by God and held in being by God. And because of that, it speaks of the mystery of its creator. So, and we human beings are part of this visible creation. We are not pure spirits, we're not angels. So we're embodied beings. We have bodies, we are body selves. Yes, we have souls, but in this world, there is no such thing as a human soul without a body. Right? So from the moment we begin our existence, in the womb of our mother until the day that we breathe our last, in this mortal world, we are embodied beings. So that's very important. If someone loves another person, that love is spiritual, right? Spiritual in its core. Love is about caring for another for his or her own sake. Uh, that's the heart of love. So I desire that the other experience true, genuine good and the actions that correspond to that desire in my heart. But that love never exists without being embodied or expressed in some way. Right? Think about if you, if you have a, a husband or a wife uh, or a, a fiancé or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or uh, even other people in your life who matter a great deal to your parents and grandparents, children. If you love someone, you express it through your body. It's, it becomes physically embodied. That could be through gestures, words, you speak, I love you. It could be through touch, being held, uh, all the way to the most sacred act of marriage in your intercourse itself which is the way the church understands it is meant to be pure self-giving love. Uh, the, the husband and the wife who offer themselves to each other in that act or giving themselves to each other in self-giving love in a way that is open to producing the gift of life. A new child comes from that union of love. So that is love fully embodied. But, you know, there are many other ways of embodying love, you know. You've probably heard about that book, The Five Love Languages. Uh, so, you know, you can embody love through 
acts of service. How do I know that my husband loves me? If he, he takes out the trash, he cuts the grass, he works, you know, he washes my car, etc., etc. You know, um, so you know, acts of service communicate a lot to some people, but they're part of our embodiment. Some people really respond to quality time together, but to be together uh, in its richest sense is interpersonal, face to face. Right? We can be together, of course, on the phone or on the computer, but all of us would have to admit. Uh, if we really love it at the end of the day, it's not always better to be face to face than it is just on the phone or just seeing somebody else on a screen, right? That's a, uh, a distant second, but it's still it's still embodied. It's still part of physical creation. So if that is so much a part of who we are as human beings, uh, the way we're created, then it makes perfect sense that our Creator chooses to love us in a way that we experience it not only spiritually, but as embodied beings. So it's very interesting, God's care for us involves the whole person, our bodies, our minds, our souls, our spirits, our whole being, all that we are matters to God. I'm gonna be projecting forward in, in time in our discussions, but we believe that in the end, Whatever the kingdom of heaven is about, we include in it a bodily dimension. Where we say in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body, in a new heavens, a new earth. So there's going to be something corporeal about eternity. So that's something to, to always remember. And uh, I recommended this book, I think, to Deacon Mike, and he, I think, has enjoyed it. There's a beautiful book by Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, one of the best modern biblical scholars, called Surprised by Hope, that talks about what happens beyond this world. And it really reflects a lot on the importance of the body being part of that and also the new heavens and the new earth. So it's not just a, we're not going to be floating around like ghosts forever in heaven, right? So, um, so that being the case, um, you could say, in a way, that the entire universe, its corporeality, its physicality, communicate, God communicates his love through the entire universe. In that sense, you know, we're, the early Christians looked at the universe itself and the world that we're living in and other persons all as sacraments in the broadest sense of that word. In fact, the uh, word for sacrament in Greek before we had the Latin word sacramentum, was the Greek word mysterion. What does mysterion translated in English as? Mystery. So Christians felt themselves living in divine mystery. All things spoke of God. But one of the Psalms says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The firmament shows forth the work of your hands. Day after day takes up the story. Night unto night makes known the message. So all creation is communicating about God. But that said, if you could talk about this sense of the whole universe being a sacrament, in the fullness of time, from a Christian point of view, God's love for us becomes focused at a moment in time and embodied in what we call the incarnation. God becomes human, takes on humanity. In that sense, Jesus is the great sacrament of say, I said, I taught about Christ. If you want to know who God is from a Christian point of view, you look at the face of Jesus. I have a good friend who said to me several years ago, he says, you know, I would just wish I could see the face of God. And I said, we have. It's the face of Jesus. And uh, he reminded me that I said that a few weeks ago, and he's never forgotten it. But when we look at the person of Jesus who took on our humanity, this is God in the flesh. I love the way the prologue of God, John's Gospel puts it, the Word was, was with God, the Word was
was God, and the Word became flesh, uh, pitched his tent among us, or made his tabernacle, dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of an only Son, coming from the Father, filled with enduring love. So he embodies God's love for us in his humanity. So those 33 years on earth, uh, all that he lived and breathed and did, and this is what we believe about Jesus. When he died on the cross and rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, he took his full humanity with him to the right hand of the God the Father. So Jesus will forever be human and have a human body in the kingdom of heaven. So that's why when he appears, risen from the dead, he has his body with him, with the wounds of the crucifixion to show, to reveal to the apostles, this is me, I'm still human. So forever, and this is, if you really stop and thought about that for very long, the fact that God, the infinite, would become finite and human, a creature like you and me, is absolutely incomprehensible from a human point of view, right? We did not deserve that. And yet, that wedding of God with humanity meant that we could be forever wed to God and become part of God's life forever. So in the ancient church, they would say, God became human so that we could become divine. And uh, some more recent theologians point out, our humanization is our divinization. The more fully human we become, the more fully godlike we really are. So in that understanding of theology, when we sin, we're being less human to each other. Where we're less the way God created us to be. The more fully human we are, the more godlike we are. Because we're created in the image and likeness of God to begin with. So if this is the case, uh, you could say the fact that God became human, embodied himself, became part of creation, united creation to himself for those 33 years or so, uh, profound. But how does that presence continue? throughout all time in history, and the answer I gave last week was the church. The church is the great sacrament of Christ. Does that make you feel a little nervous? Right? We are earthen vessels, Paul calls us, jars of clay, and yet we carry this infinite treasure, which is Christ the Lord. So you and I, we're human, we're part of the church. If, you're, if you've all been, either been baptized or gone through the rite of Brooklyn, you're part of the body that is the people of God, the body of Christ on earth. You are part of the living sacrament of Christ in the world today. So we are, we are, in fact, by our very existence, when we are baptized into Christ, we become Christ for others. And that is who we are called to be over and over again. And again, every time we sin, we are denying our, our core identity, who we really are as the beloved sons or daughters of God most high. So, uh, so that's a profound insight uh, that the church reflected on a lot uh, back during the Second Vatican Council, that the church is the great sacrament of Christ. Now, what is a sacrament? <clears throat> Anybody know the classic definition used to find it the Baltimore Catechism? Simple three point definition. A sacrament is an outward sign. An outward sign, hold on. Outward sign. Second part. Are instituted by Christ. Visible, tangible, to be experienced as embodied beings. 
that I was talking earlier, if you love somebody, you express it through your bodies, right? You say, I love you. You hug the person. You carry the garbage out. You, uh, you spend quality time with them. You bring them a box of chocolates, right? So you embody that love. Here's the beautiful thing about embodying love. What happens in a healthy human relationship when you love another person and you embody that love for the other person? Does it take some of your love away, or does it make your love grow? Your love grows, right? If you really love another human being, when you express that love for the other person, your love grows, your heart gets bigger. And what happens to the other person in a healthy human relationship who receives the gift of love? Their heart grows bigger. When they receive your love, they love you more, and they love you back and their love grows. So that's what we call the mutuality of love. So self-giving love for the other engenders in us greater love. Now this can happen, by the way, even in parent-child relationships, right? You can love your child and, and express it in a loving way. Your child may not respond in a loving way at that moment, but you still love your child even more because you've expressed that love. And someday maybe your child will understand that, right, and reciprocate that love. So that's sort of like God's love for us. God has this unconditional love for us. Sometimes we're like close to it and it's bouncing off of our hearts. At other times we have let that love in and it changes us. So outward sign, second part of the sacrament definition, instituted by Christ. So all of the sacraments of the church are connected to the person of Christ. And the third, and this is very important, the purpose of the sacraments, to give grace. And the broad definition of grace is the life of God in us. It grows the divine life within the human person. So all that God is, is given to us, and we are transformed by that living grace of God. God's living presence and power. Grace is free gift, unmerited, unheard. So, in the ancient church, I mentioned that they lived in a universe of mysteries. Many things communicated God's love to them, and they could express their love back to God through those physical things. But over time, uh, seven of these emerged as the great sacraments, so from the universe. Um, Edward Schielebex had a beautiful definition of a sacrament he called a sacrament an encounter with the risen Christ. So in every sacrament, we encounter the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph Martos wrote a beautiful little book called The Doors to the Sacred, a historical study of the sacraments. And he called them doors. Sacraments are doors to the sacred. They're the doors through which we go to encounter the holy mystery of God. So you think about sacraments, there, there's something that's tangible about them, an outward sign, a symbolic action, word, or ritual, or some embodied part to it. Think about baptism. What's the embodied part of baptism? Water, they're okay, getting plunged in that water, buried in that water, water poured over you, poured over your head. So that's the outward sign. Instituted by Christ, it's connected with Christ himself. We'll talk about that with each of the seven. Uh, purpose, to bring about the new divine life within us. The Holy Trinity that will dwell within the newly baptized. So they have an effect. Sacraments, we say, effect what they signify. So they don't just point you to the new life in Christ. Baptism doesn't, it's not, a, it's not an empty sign. It's an effective sign. It's an instrument through which God is working. So that's very different, by the way, than a Baptist understanding of sacraments. So a Baptist would say, you hear the good news about Jesus, you believe it, and you put faith, that's the saving mystery, your interior faith, and yes, you're baptized then as an outward sign of the inner reality. From a Catholic point of view, no, the outward sign itself is part of the action of God. So God is really working through the waters of baptism to claim a person for himself. You are now my beloved son, 
your loved beloved, beloved daughter, God himself is acting through those sacraments. They effect what they signify, is a way of putting it. So, all right, so uh, questions about this kind of big overview before we start plunging into individual sacraments and their connection to Christ. Sort of the sacramental view of Catholicism is certainly a defining characteristic of Catholicism. We share it richly with the Orthodox. So the Eastern churches are very sacramental and as equally sacramental as we would be Orthodox churches. The Anglican Communion has a bit of that sense of sacramental sense. They're richly imbued with that. Lutherans a little bit less. When you get to the Baptists and Church of Christ, we're moving in the direction of moving away from John Calvin, probably of the great Protestant reformers in Zwingli, were least inclined to be sacramental in their view. They thought that God was God and the world was separate from God and did not. You don't put those two together, either or. So they definitely thought sacraments, God is not really acting through outward signs. God is pure spirit. So those are just, just signs. Yeah, so we Catholics are both and. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so we believe that, yes, you have to have that interior faith in God. In that sense, all sacraments are also sacraments of faith. All seven, they require faith on the part of the person of the church. Um, so God doesn't operate apart from our human response, but we also, it's a both and, but God is also working. It's a both and rather than either or. Um, yeah, so as those seven principal sacraments got defined, we made a distinction much later in, in Catholic theology between these sacraments, the seven, and what we call sacramentals with an A-L at the end. So that would be more of a distinction that came from scholastic theology and maybe a thousand years or so after Christ. So what are examples of sacramentals? These are not one of the seven proper sacraments, but they remind us of God. They really are outward signs. The rosary is a great example. Medals, crucifixes, crosses. Statues, stained glass, sacred music, windows, incense, candles, any visible, physical thing that arouses in you spiritual desire or devotion to God, those are all sacramentals. Um, what's the difference between a sacramental and a sacrament? Sacramentals really are only outward signs. God is not acting through the crucifix, right? in the same way that he acts through the Eucharist, for example. So the dying and rising of Jesus at the Eucharist are present again. God is representing to us his self-giving love on the cross of Calvary and his resurrection at every Mass we celebrate. God is still acting. And the crucifix were reminded of what God did. So it really is, a, there's a different level of connection with God in that sense between sacramentals and sacraments. Sacramentals are all very helpful, but the seven sacraments are the principal ways that the church becomes church and lives our connection with God. All right, someone give me the three great sacraments that make a Christian, the beginning sacraments of initiation. We got three of them. Confirmation, good. Sometimes also called chrismation. And 
sacrament of initiation? Do you raise it? Do you raise it? These are the three sacraments of initiation. So they begin our Christian life. Um, so when you heard the good news in the ancient church and wanted to become a follower of Jesus, uh, you learned the faith, you were exposed to the preaching of the gospel, you believed that teaching and wanted to say yes to it, you were baptized, you were plunged in water. So we're gonna look at that next week. Immediately thereafter, you back a baptismal bath was sealed with sacred chrism on the forehead in the sign of the cross. And hands were extended over the newly baptized, communicating the gift of the Holy Spirit, what we call confirmation. If you asked in the ancient church, are these two sacraments? They would have thought you had three hands. What do you mean by that? This is a great mystery in which we're claimed by Christ through water and sacred chrism. It was one great event that took place. Right? We later made these distinctions, and partly because the two moments in that ritual got separated in time from each other. All right, but then once you were sealed, uh, you would approach for the first time the Eucharistic table of the Lord Jesus, and you would receive for the first time the body and blood of Christ and the Eucharist. So those three sacraments together are the ones which, in a sense, create a Christian. It's the, gives us the birth to new life in God. So for those of you who are going to be baptized at the Easter Vigil, you're going to experience this reality. You'll experience baptism, you'll be confirmed, and you'll receive your First Holy Communion. So you will experience these first three sacraments of initiation. All right, so uh, in essence, if life is good for you, that's probably all the sacraments you'll need, but we also realize further down the road that sometimes the one who is already a follower of Jesus needs to be healed or forgiven. So there are two sacraments of healing and forgiveness. And those are? Reconciliation. And the anointing of the sect. Two sacraments for healing and forgiveness. Why? Because after baptism, sometimes we do not live fully the life of Christ. We still stray off the mark, and that means medicinal healing. The primary healing after baptism is the Eucharist itself, but sometimes the sacrament of reconciliation is very helpful. It has a whole history which we want to look at uh, in the church, and also for the sick. Sometimes our bodies in this physical mortal world are prone to weakness and illness. So the need for healing uh, becomes part of that great Christian journey. So sacraments of healing and forgiveness. And the last two sacraments are sacraments of vocation, sacraments of order in the church, and in a sense of vocational commitment. What would those last two sacraments be? All right, holy orders and marriage. <coughs> so those are the seven sacraments of the church. So we're going to be doing over the next few weeks is we're going to be diving in depth. So next week, we're going to look at the sacraments of initiation. The week after that, we'll look at the sacraments of healing and forgiveness. And the week after that, we're going to look at the sacraments of vocation and commitment. So, um, 
All seven of these are sacraments of the church, so they're celebrated by the church itself. There's no such thing as a private sacrament. Even when a priest goes to uh, a person who has died alone on his or her bed and awakes that person, this is not a private encounter between a priest and uh, an individual, but this is a celebration of the Church of God. So in that sense, the priest, the priest of the priest, the priesthood of the priest is a share of Christ's priesthood. It is really Christ the priest who is acting sacramentally at that moment. So the church is made present when two or more are gathered to celebrate a sacramental ritual. That's why you can't only have one person for a sacrament. I can't jump out of my car if I've not been baptized into some. I really want to baptize myself and dump water over my head. I can't baptize myself. I can't absolve myself of my sins. So we have to, sacraments are things that require at least two people, two humans, for them to be valid. So the church is embodied, we're for each other, God always works in community. So no private, always sacraments are sacraments of the church. They're all sacraments of faith. Uh, they're all sacraments which God is working in and the human is responding. All seven of the sacraments, the Holy Spirit is at work, and all of them are connected with the presence of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So in that sense, all the sacraments are Trinitarian. They're ecclesial, they're parts of the church, and yet they're also very personal. They touch our lives in a very personal, real way. Um, so it makes sense to me that if God created us as human beings and body, that when God chose to communicate love for us in his new life, that he would do it in a way that we can experience it in our bodies. That I can feel the water, that I can be touched by the oil, that I can feel the hands on my head, that I can eat and drink, taste and chew and swallow and ingest. Think about that for a moment. So that's a very intimate, personal encounter with God, right? Can't get much more personal than that, right? So our, our bonding with God is very tangible. That's what we mean, sacramental, you know. Um, questions? So, like, maybe a grandmother might baptize an infant without telling the parents of the child. Yes. I don't recommend it, but some grandparents do it, right? So, <laughs> they, want, they want the child to be part of the church, and, you know, so it's an act of love on the grandparents' part. You know, it's interesting, because if a grandparent uses water and says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and intends to baptize the child, we believe that child is baptized. So... They are a member of the body of Christ. So sometimes later, the grandparent has to explain that to the parents. Occasionally that has to happen. So, yeah. I just have to throw a further hypothetical to build off that one. So let's say that, say, the grandchild was now seeking confirmation and communion with the church, and later on even marriage. Would the church or many, if any, diocese recognize the grandparent baptism? Yeah, you have to have proof, right? Otherwise, you're conditionally baptized in case you were fully baptized. But yeah, if he says, yeah, my grandmother baptized me, she told me when I was an infant. And um, grandma's still alive, you call her, did you really baptize him? Yes, did you use water? Yes, did you say I baptized you in the name of us? Did you attend to baptism? Okay, you're baptized. You try to remember what the date was, and then we put a record in the church, that sacramental record. We'll talk more about how we get to baptism, but any human being can baptize another human being in, in Pergola Mortis, we say in danger of death. If you're driving down the road and 
and you see a car wreck and you go over to the person and they say, I've never been baptized, I want to be baptized before I die. You got your bottle of water with you, you can baptize that person. You just pour it over their head. What's your name? John. John, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That person is baptized. Sometimes nurses do it in hospitals. Christening and is another name for baptism, even though some Protestant churches have a ceremony called christening that's not really baptism, but for all sex actual intent and purposes, most of the time the word is interchangeable with baptism. <coughs> to christen someone is to baptize them. Sometimes they call it the sacrament of enlightenment. Different names for it in the history of the church. Love is always embodied, right? So we see God's love embodied and we look around us in the faces of our brothers and sisters. So, um, yeah, so that's the beautiful thing about the church being the body of Christ. We see God in each other. All right, so yes, we will dive into more depth next week. Um, but one thing I want you to think about with these seven sacraments, and I'll talk about it next week as we get into initiation. I mentioned each of the seven is connected with the person of Jesus. You might think about how are these seven realities connected to his life and ministry. So it's a good thought to experiment for next week. And I think we have questions at the table tonight. Uh, yeah, and they're good questions. So y'all can go to your tables and start sharing. So.